Hi, I'm Megan, an educationalist. This video is part of a series based on the book and project Education for Humanity. Today, we'll be looking at Cathar women, part of the study of the human story, with Simonon Honoré, a historian and author of the book. Welcome, Simonon. Hello. Simonon, can you explain why you focused on Cathar women? Well, one of the ideas in Education for Humanity is to give all the voices that are so often unheard in the human story uh, an opportunity. And those voices apply to marginalised groups or the illiterate, above all women, who despite forming off the human population, are so often not merely silenced, but never really heard. This particular group of women found a moment of empowerment in their lives and came into contact with the authorities, clashed with the authorities, and as a result of interrogation, interview, court appearances, we've got to know a little bit about their lives and hear, albeit to a distorted mirror, hear their voices. Thank you, Simonon. Could you please explain who were the Cathars? The first thing I should have to say is they did not call themselves Cathars. If you asked them who they were, they would have said, we're the good Christians, the good men, the good women. What they were were a spiritual movement in the Middle Ages, mainly the 12th and 13th century, who sought to follow in the footsteps of Jesus to follow the true teaching. And we'll see that in the first quote that the Cathar bishop, Guillaume says, gold and silver, I no longer carry my purse. I'm satisfied with each day's food, and I'm not anxious whether tomorrow I shall have enough to be clothed and fed. You see me in the teachings which Jesus preached and in which his gospels consist. So, what you would have seen is somebody who lived a life of simplicity, of poverty, preaching the words of Jesus, trying to help people. Now, this was somewhat in contrast with the established Catholic Church, where corruption and greed uh, were widespread. And we see this with the second quote from Pope Innocent the third, that's the head of the Catholic Church. And this is what he says about one of his own archbishops. The Archbishop of Narbonne knows no other god than money. His heart is a bank. Well, if that's what the Pope says, you can imagine what other people thought of the Catholic Church. And then there's the impact they had by the where they lived on the people around them. And here we have a Catholic knight explaining why he didn't expel Cathars from his lands. We have been brought up side by side with them. Our closest kinsmen are numbered among them. Every day we see them living worthy and honourable lives in our midst. And that's so important because it's the example that the Cathars set. Now, they had their own doctrines, their own ideas about the universe and so on, which the Catholic Church focused on and said they were heretics and all the rest of it. But that's not really what interested people. What interested people is that they lived the life of Jesus and his apostles. And that's what drew them to the Cathars. And that's what really frightened the church. Thank you for insight, Simonon. Please, could you explain where the Cathars came from? Well, uh, some of their ideas may have come from the Far East, maybe as far away as Afghanistan or Iran. What we can say for sure is the Cathar movement um, developed in the Balkans, in Bosnia, Bulgaria, the Byzantine Empire, just to explain, that's the Eastern Greek-speaking half of the Roman Empire that survived the fall of Rome. 
There they were called Bogomiles after their leader, uh, the name of their leader. Then they spread westwards over the Alps into northern Italy, and then westwards again into southern France, including the great cities of Toulouse and Foix, in an area called the Languedoc. Thank you, Simon. Simon, please, could you explain the world of the Cathars? Yes, indeed. Well, if you look at this map, you'll see this vast expanse, the Mongol Empire, that grew during the 13th century, it began as a small group of nomadic warriors and became the largest land empire the world has ever seen. It terrified uh, the Christian world. They thought they were devils. They, uh, they didn't know where they came from. It would be as if there was an alien invasion in the 21st century. And then we see various Islamic states that challenged Christian Europe from the south, the Almohads in what is now Morocco and southern Spain, the Mamelukes, Egypt, Syria, parts of Saudi Arabia, and the Turks in what indeed is modern Turkey. Now, if we move on to focus on Europe itself, what we see is France is divided the blue area there is under control of the French king. On the southwest, we see a red area that's under English control. And we see the Languedoc. This is the area where Catharism spread in France. They spoke a language, Languedoc-Occident, which wasn't French. It's closer to Catalan or Italian. And you can see there um, the various states that uh, surrounded France and presented various challenges. So there was a lot going on as Catharism spread. Thank you, Simnon. Um, I wonder what the position of women was in Long Dark. It was distinctive. They had greater legal and social equality than in the rest of France. Women could hold land in their own right if they were unmarried or widowed. For example, the Viscountess of Narbonne. Um, ran her territory for 60 years, very effectively. And a number of women uh, joined the Cathars, including their priest of the Parfait, which gave them a whole area of spiritual expression which was denied to them by the Catholic Church. However, we shouldn't see this through rose-tinted glasses. The average peasant or farmer um, woman would live a very oppressed life. Um, at the hands of their husbands and, and males in the village, as they grew into being a village elder, then they had more respect. But the, the lot of the average uh, woman in the Long Dock wasn't that much different to the rest of France. Thank you, Simon. I find that quite interesting to know that at a period of time that we're talking about, that women, when you and I think back, I, I think women. We're progressively getting more rights. We're getting more like control of our own autonomy. Um, so it's interesting to know that historically there was a group who, and I know we spoke about a different class system, but there was a particular group of women who seemed to have more access than maybe some women have today um, globally. So that's a really interesting observation to make there. Thank you for that. Um, how did the church react to the spread of Catharism? Well, uh, they began by preaching. They had some formal debates. They managed to score a few doctrinal points, but it didn't really work because the attraction of the Cathars wasn't really their doctrine at all. It was their lifestyle. Um, Pope got frustrated. He sent a sort of papal delegation to the Long Dock and to the greatest of the nobles, Raymond Count. Toulouse. Now, Raymond Count of Toulouse was a sort of pleasure-seeking aristocrat who generally sat on the fence about everything, including religion. He had Cathars at court, didn't really care, turned a blind eye. Anyway, this papal delegation turned up, led by Pierre of Cassonlau, and they had the most <clears throat> furious row. One of uh, Raymond's knights murdered Pierre, thinking that's what his Master the Count wanted. It wasn't because the whole roof fell in. The Pope preached a crusade against uh, 
the long dock against the Cathars, the long dock. Crusaders, mainly from the north of France, swept in, massacred everybody uh, in, in, in the most brutal way. A lot of the Cathar priesthood, their parfait, scattered to the hills. And hand in hand with that, they set up the Inquisition, which is a combination of sort of detective force, judge and jury. And their aim was to root out this Cathar heresy. If you were arrested by the Inquisition, you were not told exactly what the charges were against you. You were not told who your accusers were. You could, in theory, have a lawyer, but if a lawyer defended you, they themselves would be open to charge of heresy. So very few lawyers did. The only thing really you could do is, is provide a list of people with whom you had a long-standing enmity and then hope those corresponded to some of your accusers. Anyhow, um, they spread throughout the long dock and punishments could range from prison, fines, having to wear a yellow cross, which was the mark of the Cathars, and for repeat offenders, burning. Thank you, Simonon. Um, what opportunities and challenges did Catharism provide for women? Well, the first thing is that he gave them a spiritual voice. The Cathar priesthood, the parfait, was open to both women and men. Uh, and women not only preached, they uh, operated as physicians, as nurses. Uh, they were highly skilled in various crafts, including weaving. Um, and many women were also Cathar followers, which meant they had lived ordinary lives, but they supported the Cathar power of faith, sometimes giving them food, giving them shelter and so forth. And we've also discovered through case studies that Cathar women supported each other, sending parcels of food if they were imprisoned by the Inquisition, for example. And another interesting fact is that Catharism cut across the social barriers. For example, um, Beatrice de Canisol, who we shall come across again later, who was the lady of the manor, had her, her closest five friends, women who were peasants, who were maidservants, but they were all Cathars, and that kind of bound them together. Mm. And then we have the issue of women and the Inquisition and the way those two issues intermingled. So we look here at a quote from the Cathar Pierre Autier to his son-in-law, Arnaud, and it's about the way his son-in-law was treating his wife, Pierre's daughter. You don't get on well with your wife, my daughter Guillemette. You are harsh and cruel to her, and in that you're acting against scripture which bids a man to be peaceful, gentle, and tender. So it's the Cathar principle about how to behave. And Arlo replies, it's your daughter's fault. She's bad-tempered and gossip. And take care yourself not to be caught by the jaw because of your heretic's long tongue. So there's a real threat there. You know? Don't push it, mate, or I could screw you up to the Inquisition. And then the other quote is two friends, Fabrice and Alizé. We used to quarrel often. We only stopped quarrelling the day when each of us found the little heretical secrets of the other. That's to say they're both Cathars, which put us in the position to betray one another before the Inquisitor. So then we stopped quarrelling. Thank you for that, Simon. It's What strikes me is the, the attitude between the father and the son-in-law um, and quite a striking different attitude from between the two on the treatment of women um, and, you know, how just basic humanity, really. Um, but that it's a very, it's a simple, a very simple quote, but it really does give a an overarching summary, I think. It really gives a good insight into uh, two men at the, of, uh, of similar age well, and um, similar times, but having such contrasting views on their attitudes towards women. 
Thank you for that seminar. I was wondering, are there any individual women's stories that stand out? Yes. Well, the first is Escarmont de Foix. Now, she was the sister of the Count de Foix, one of the great nobles of the Languedoc. She became a Cathar parfait, that's to say a Cathar priest, and she was one of the great lights of the Cathar movement, an astounding figure. Together with her sister-in-law, she supported fellow Cathars. She had a school for girls. It said she helped building of hospitals and care homes. So she's very active. And in 1207, that's the year before Pierre de Castelnau was murdered and the whole crusade started, she participated in a public debate with the Catholics. Uh, and she spoke at the debate. And of course, it shocked the Catholic representatives that a woman should speak. And indeed, we hear Brother Stephen of Minia telling her, go to your spinning, madam. It is not proper for you to speak in the debate of this sort. Well, you can imagine how that went down. Yeah. Following year, crusade uh, begins. She becomes a wanted person. Uh, she made her home at the great Cathar fortress of Montségur, about which we will discover more later, where she carried on her work. We think she died sometime before 1240, but her body has never been found, which kind of adds to the mystery. But she was certainly one of the great luminaries of the Cathar movement. And then the next person, rather by contrast, is Beatrice de Planisson, an amazing woman. Now, she was the Chatelaine of Montaillou. As you can see, Montaillou uh, is a small village in the Pyrenees, about 250 people. So she was lady of the manor. The manor was quite modest. She married her first husband and, and became Chatelaine. He was away a lot, so she spent a lot of time running the place, and it gave her quite a lot of free time. When he died, and again, this reflects the laws of the Londoc, she got her dowry back, that's to say the money that she had brought with her when she got married, and that gave her some financial independence. She travelled a lot. Um, she had a number of children, a number of relationships, got married several times. And many adventures. She lived a very full life. One of the things that's interesting is how her sexual experiences and her Catharism kind of intermingled. So the first thing is when her husband was away, the steward, let's say manager of the um, manor, kept on asking her to go with him to meet some Cathar parfait. OK, very insistent. And she said, well, look, I've got kids to look after and so forth, I've got a husband. And then, sure enough, one night, this is what she tells happened. Raymond, this is the uh, steward, emerged from under my bed, lay next to me in his nightshirt and started to act in a manner which suggested he desired to have sex with me. When I exclaimed, what does this mean? He urged me to be, keep quiet. To this I replied, how now, you peasant? Shall I keep quiet then? And started to scream and call my maidservants. She carries on to Raymond. Now I see clearly that the intention behind your words about going to join the good Christians was only to possess me and, and to have sex with me. If it were not that my husband might assume I acted dishonourably with you, I would at once have you thrown into the deepest dungeon. So not a very good introduction to Catharism, you might say, but nevertheless, she developed her, her connections, not with him, um, and went on many travels. She had a number of relationships, one of which was a very strange character, Pierre Clerc, who was both a priest and head of the local Cathar network. Not a very pleasant man, but an intriguing man. And 
the story is recounted that they had sex in the church together. And I should explain that wasn't that they happened to be in a church and were overcome with passion. Pierre Clerg set up a bed in a church in order for them to make love. And Beatrice was somewhat surprised. And she said, how can we do such a thing in the Church of St. Pierre? And he went, oh, what grievance, harm will this be to St. Peter? Now, having sex in a church is absolutely sacrilegious. So in a sense, it's both a sex act and a challenge to the Catholic Church combined in, in the same way. Now, the Ephesus became uh, a Cathar follower. Uh, she was never uh, totally committed. Um, and we know that there's a certain amount of waxing and waning. She supported the Cathars. We know he sent sacks of flowers to flower to the Cathar Parfait, who was on the run. Um, other times she said she wasn't interested in heretics. We know she went to church, but we can't tell whether that was to allay suspicion, maybe meet up with one of her priest lovers. She had several. Um, what we do know is that she was overheard uh, making rude remarks about the uh, communion wafer, suggesting that uh, if this really was the body of Christ, as the Catholic Church claimed happened when he was blessed, then uh, he would have been eaten long ago because people had been munching their way through wafers um, since time immemorial. Now, that kind of taking the mick out of Catholic doctrine is very Cathar, and she she got in trouble uh, for it. Um, so eventually the Inquisition caught up with her, they not only quizzed her about her Catholicism, they also quizzed her about her folk magic. She had things, for example, like an umbilical cord that belonged to her grandson, which she used to bring good luck to uh, a legal case. Really, they were interested in, in Pierre Clerc, who they correctly suspected of being a double agent. And anyway, she sort of blabbed a bit, and then she tried to withdraw it. It didn't do her any good. She sort of tried to explain away all these strange magical things she had in her bag. She ended up being put in prison. And then after a year, she was released, but she had to wear a yellow cross for the rest of her life. So she had a full life, and in a way, one that is typical of so many Cathar followers who were women. Thank you, Simonon. She sounds a very, a woman of many layers. Um, very interesting, multi-depth, um, and often you wouldn't necessarily think that a woman of those times who was following a particular religion would have all of those interesting elements. Um, the the word that springs to mind is as though she's seeking a sense of freedom almost. So she's... Yes exploring the things she wants to explore. She wants to go to the church. She wants to have sex with priests. She wants to be part of her community. She wants to... It sounds like she's living an authentic life to her, and she's not necessarily worried saying, I am the Lady of the Manor, I am a Cathar, I am this, I am that. She sounds like a very authentic woman who is living her truth and going about things the way she wants to go away about her things. So it's, it's, a, it's nice to hear, despite maybe the end of the story isn't super positive, but it's nice to hear that she had such a life and she was trying to live the life that she wanted to live and do as she pleases, really, which, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 a, it's nice to hear the story. Thank you for sharing that, Simonon. What happened to the Cathars in the end? Well, um, Simon de Montfort, you see him depicted in this picture here, came to a sticky end. He was besieging Toulouse, and a rather large stone fell on him, catapulted, it is said, by a group of girls and women from the ramparts, and it smashed his skull. So that was the end of Simon de Montfort. 
then, following his death, the crusade continued under the leadership of the French king, who rather used to extend his authority into the Landoc, which previously had been rather weak. Um, the Cathars retreated to their mountain fortresses, and we see here the amazing fortress of Montségur, which I had indeed have been to in my youth and climbed the side of. It's an incredible place, an extraordinary atmosphere, and looks impregnable, which it very nearly but not quite was. It fell in 1244. The 200 or so Parfait priests, Cathar priests, were given the option of recanting or being burnt alive, and they opted for being burnt alive. I should mention at this point there is no record of any Cathar woman Parfait ever recanting. Astonishing. And then the last uh, fortress fell about 10 years after that. The very last Cathar Parfait was burnt alive in 1321. Um, so on paper, Catharism disappeared, but maybe the spirit lives on. Mm. Certainly the spirit of trying to follow the teachings of Jesus um, rather than the doctrine and hierarchy of this or that church. Thank you for that, Simonon. Um, it's, yeah, the, the story of the women with the catapult is certainly, yeah, it summarises up the, the feeling of the local women quite well, I think. So thank you for that insight to Cathal, women as a whole. Um, what strikes me most, the, the theme throughout and reflecting on what you've just said about finding your own journey and your own path and not following the doctrine. It sounds like a lot of these women were following their own paths and whether that is their spirituality, whether that is their sexuality, whether that is, you know, how they decide to maybe break social norms and interact with people who have a different class to them. Um, yeah, that's. I feel that for me that's the the running theme throughout what we've learned today is people following their own path, people following their own journey, people living authentically um, and doing what feels right for them. Um, so thank you very much for all of that information, Seminon. And if anybody would like to find out more about the work we're doing, you can visit educationforhumanity.co.uk. That's educationforhumanity.co.uk. Thank you, Simonon. Thank you.